Everybody have a seat? Everybody come around? Got coffee? Okay. Ready to roll? Good morning. Uh, again, I'm Jenny Warner with Miami Valley Nonprofit Collaborative. Thank you for attending. Um, I am hoping that we make this really interactive. Um, I've got a lot of material, it seems like, as I always do, that I try to pack in uh, to a fairly short period of time. So the Brady Bear staff is going to help keep me uh, on track. But I'm hoping what I have to share with you today is some very practical, uh, takeaway kind of information. Um, when Brady Ware asked me to speak this morning, I was trying to think of, out of all the things that I'm really passionate about and really care about, how do I wrap all that into you know, one 45 minute uh, session or so? And so I thought I'd just go back to the bones of what makes a healthy nonprofit. So we're calling this professional management, and I will um, admit that I am borrowing this professional management term from Amarange. So in our journeys over the last three years of uh, forming and running and really evolving the Miami Valley Nonprofit Collaborative, we've been chatting quite a bit with Amron. So we're hoping we're going to have, we're going to be able to build, uh, you know, a, a, a more consistent relationship with them. They have amazing resources, obviously, in building and running healthy, small to mid-sized for-profit organizations. If you're not familiar, Aileron um, started out of the, the IMES um, organization. And IMES University used to do a whole segment of training and development for nonprofits. Then um, Aileron came along, and again, they're really focused on the for profit industry. They have a lot of expertise in running healthy nonprofits. So, all that to say, I'm really borrowing, admittedly, the professional management term uh, that Aileron uses for all of their teachings around building a healthy uh, for-profit organization. So, so what are the key components of a professionally managed nonprofit organization? So I will also say, this is really my take. This is Jenny's take on what is a professionally managed nonprofit. So I'm open to input. So anybody along the line here, if you feel like I've missed something or we should elaborate or stress something more, you know, please feel free to jump in. But over all of my years as a staff member working for a number of nonprofits, a board member certainly supporting nonprofits, I'm a volunteer naturally, I love to partner and I've been involved in a lot of program development and management, working with other and partnering, collaborating with other um, nonprofit organizations. I'm sorry to have my back to you, I'm not supposed to get too close to that. So, or you're not gonna like it. So, um, so as a partner, I get to see and work with a lot of other nonprofit agencies. So what I observe um, as a, from a partner perspective, I also do consulting. Um, and through the nonprofit collaborative, of course, I have met so many uh, nonprofit professionals and gotten to know your agencies and what you do. So, from all of that perspective, is what I'm really sharing with you this morning. So, key components of a professionally managed um, organization strategic plan. It all starts with a strategic plan. I cannot stress that enough. Um, and, and obviously that strategic plan equates or translates into organizational goals. Um, got a couple people in the audience today that I used to work with at the Y, Becky and Paul. Um, I think we all, always at the Y did a fantastic job about strategic planning. And we learned that from IMES. We learned that from that IMES model that they were teaching nonprofits, um, you know, on, on how to work effectively. We'll talk more about that. Obviously, then, if you have a strategic plan and you have agency goals, that translates into team and individual goals and performance goals. So it all translates. I'm going to show you in a practical way how that, how that works. I have an HR background. So prior to joining the nonprofit sector, I worked for about 20 years in the, in the human resource and training and development area. That was my expertise, supporting a lot of different types of organizations. I am all about the strengths-based movement. Who do we have? What are their strengths? <laughs> Using that old analogy, get the right people and the right seats on the bus. Sometimes you have to realign the seats. Sometimes you have to redesign the bus <laughs> to take it where you, you know, where you're going, um, and make sure that aligns with people's passion, you know, as well. We're going to talk more about that, and then operational excellence. Um, how we're doing, what we're doing, are we doing it um, with excellence, ethically, etc. So to me, the strategic plan 
agency goals, the employee goal, the team and employee goals, that's all what we do for our nonprofits, right? It's who we serve, our programs, and our services. The strengths-based part of it is with whom do we serve, you know, the, our individuals and clients, our staff and our volunteers. And then finally, operational excellence is all about how we do it, okay? With what quality uh, do we run our operations? So digging into each one of these a little further. So what does it look like? So we're gonna talk about what does that look like when we do have each of those four uh, key components. Okay, so I thought with, just, just to make this fun um, and, and interesting, what does it look like when there isn't one of the key components? And I'll give you a couple examples of this. A strategic plan. So in my travels, I supported at one point an organization that did not have a strategic plan. Um, and, and what was happening in that organization is they were taking one of their programs and they were expanding it into another neighborhood. So the same thing they were doing, they weren't creating something new in terms of their program services, but they were just expanding their reach. They had had a community or a neighborhood, I should say, that was really asking for their support and it had taken many years where they were considering this and they decided, yes, okay, now is the time we're gonna expand what we're doing into another area. The executive director, um, of the organization and the board were very supportive of that. Okay, obviously they were leading or, um, organizational discussions around that. Um, however, they didn't have a plan. Or if they did, it hadn't been revisited for many years. It was up on the shelf. I heard somebody say that, you know, this morning. Um, the vice president of one particular area, the operational area, really was not supportive of the um, plan to expand that service into another neighborhood. And I don't think it was for, it was like ill, um, I, I don't think it was a bad intention necessarily, but that individual, you know, our resources are tight wherever we are, and she was just protecting her resources. We're barely getting done what we're doing today, let alone take this into a new neighborhood. So she wasn't supportive and wasn't dedicating resources toward that expansion um, effort, or very minimally, I should say. Um, so therefore, things just weren't done, getting done. It was kind of like we take a couple steps forward, a couple steps back, you know, step forward, step back. It was just had this kind of ebb and flow in terms of um, the, the progress towards that. It was very unclear to staff. It was interesting, um, you know, <coughs> interesting to hear people say, staff members say, oh, I don't, we're doing that. <coughs> yeah, we're doing that. We're expanding. You know, what about that new neighborhood? It was really unclear, even at the, um, you know, very um, the lower levels of the organization, what was happening with that expansion. You know, kind of effort. Um, other staff were unclear about prioritization. This was interesting. So when that expansion effort needed something, you know, one department might say, "Well, I got a bunch of other things, and these things are more important." So, and, you know, so the timeliness of response to supporting, you know, some of those things weren't happening either. So as you can see, just lack of clear direction starting from the top in a plan, it's written, it's something we can point to, we are accountable to the board, we're accountable to that new neighborhood who we promised we're bringing, you know, the service into, it just ultimately did not go. So there's a good example of not having a plan. This is kind of interesting. Um, same organization, of course, if they didn't have a plan, they didn't have a process, you know, for um, re developing and reviewing their strategic plan. So that, that you'll find this, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of, of you can um, relate to this. That particular organization did in the past rely pretty heavily on governmental kind of funding. Um, naturally, things are changing, right? And, and the climate for that uh, government funding was, was changing and the amount of funds that were available was diminishing. Um, and that was not discussed in a SWOT analysis, in a strategic planning process development you know, and or review. So I think there were certain individuals within the organization that understood those diminishing funds, what was happening, what, what it was looking like, you know, what the prognosis was for that, but not everyone understood that. So again, different staff members, hey, why, are, why aren't we getting that? We do have those state dollars, right? No, we don't have those state dollars. Remember, we talked, you know, it wasn't clear, you know, throughout the organization. 
when we have, and, and again, I'll point to the why. Why did a great job every single year of reviewing their strategic plan? And they would start with a SWOT analysis every single year. Kind of seemed like ad nauseum, because some things weren't necessarily changing, but other things definitely did you know, hit the radar um, in a new year. And that SWOT, the results of the SWOT analysis was shared throughout the entire organization. Now, the, the Y obviously is a big organization, uh, 1,200 employees, something like that, 1,500, you know, in the summer season. So a lot of employees. However, the, the results of the SWOT analysis, that was shared to every single um, staff member. Anyone could review that and say, oh, diminishing government, you know, government funds, I didn't even know that was happening. So we do our employees, a, you know, a service certainly by sharing things that are talked about at the leadership and the, the, the staff and the board leadership um, levels. Okay, so here's what a plan looks like. Again, Jenny's take and what I've seen in the past. So with a strategic plan, naturally every year you, you review your mission and vision. So who are we, what do we do? Is our, is our mission changing? Is our vision changing? That does change. Um, you know, certainly depending on community needs. So that's revisited and very clearly expressed in the strategic plan. Um, I'm just giving you an example of four different goals that are pretty common for nonprofits. A nonprofit might have a different goal, but these are pretty um, standard. High, pro high quality programs, relevant, timely, high quality programs, whatever your program or service is that you're providing to your, to your clients. Um, a second goal around long-term financial viability. You know, clearly that government funding you know, issue would fall under that. Um, robust marketing messaging. How are we telling the story of our outcomes and what we're doing? And finally, are we assuring that we have the right staff and volunteer structure to support all of that? We, we talked about that a little bit ago with board uh, governance. Okay, so here's what a plan, digging into this, kind of drilling down further, what a strategic plan could look like. So number one, um, again, under a relevant high quality program, an objective, right? So once we have the goal, then we're gonna set the objectives every, every year. There may be three or four objectives for your organization under high quality uh, programs. Maybe in a given year, it's just one. Again, there's no magic number to this. But you may have more than this, but just an example. Objective, in that example I was giving you about the, not, the agency not having a strategic plan, what they might have had is objective number one under their programs is expanding their reach into that new neighborhood. So if that's an objective, an activity under that objective would be stakeholder meetings. So we need to get to that new neighborhood and we need to meet with the schools, we need to meet with other nonprofits. You know, we need to meet with um, churches in the neighborhood. We need to figure out how, how do we talk to some of the potential clients being served in that neighborhood. So that might be an, a, an activity for that particular you know, upcoming year um, under that high quality program. I gave you a couple of, or giving you a couple of other uh, examples for the other goals as well. Again, Buck and Y did a really good job with this. Um, you know, I really, um, we'll, we'll promote this when I'm su supporting other organizations. Have it drilled down. You've got the overarching goals, but specifically for the next, and, and your plan may be a five-year plan, but we, we break this out into um, what are we doing this next year, okay? So specifically in 2018, when are we holding those stakeholder meetings? They're gonna be first quarter. And how are we gonna measure that? There's also a measurement um, that we express in the strategic plan. So how many stakeholder meetings, what are the sectors, you know, what are the groups of individuals that we're gonna be talking to, all that is very expressly um, uh, listed in our strategic plan. Christine. Okay. Yes. <coughs> One thing that I have found helpful too is assigning people or groups of people to do those things. To who's responsible for making sure that goal is met. Sometimes that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Perfect segue. Um, uh, thank you for teeing that up. So, okay, so next piece of the plan. No, 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 don't be quiet. That's good. We want this to be interactive. So the next part of the strategic plan is we've got the plan, we've got the objectives, we've got the activities for next year, right? So the next piece is who's going to do it? If you don't assign who's going to do it, staff and or volunteers, does it get done? No. Probably not. 
So the next piece is um, staff and team for every single one of those objectives, activities, um, with a timeline, with a measurement, etc. cetera. Um, this may be done not in the strategic planning process, but after the strategic plan is approved by your, your board. So once you know this is what we're doing, then you sit down and say, all right, who's doing that? Who's going to take the lead on that? And by when will they do it? Okay, um, then taking this down a level further, we're going to look at employee performance goals. So if we said, let me go back, if we said that, uh, you know, Jenny Warner is, and her team are going to be lead those stakeholder, you know, meetings, for example, in my performance goals for the upcoming year, it's clearly express that, that I'm accountable to that, that's what I'll be evaluated on, these are the primary focus of my work activities for, for the next year. This again is what didn't happen in the example I gave you when there was no plan, there was no goals, there were no objectives, there were no activities, and there was no staff accountable. So the staff was like, are we doing this or not? She's doing that. No, I didn't think we were doing it at all. I mean, there was so much confusion. Um, and in this, you know, example, I might, I, I gave this, I kind of jumped ahead, assuming that um, in my example we were going to be expanding. Maybe this performance goal would say stakeholder meetings. Okay, Jenny and her team are going to have those stakeholder meetings and really assess whether or not we can move into this new neighborhood. You know, that's my performance goal or one of my performance goals, you know, for the year. Um, and then it's, you know, really spelled out. Who am I meeting with? By when am I meeting with them? What are the different groups and, and agencies and such that I'm going to make sure that we get good in information from as to whether or not this is feasible? Okay, so let me pause there. So that's really the crux of it. You've got a plan. You've got mission, vision, who, you, who you're serving and why. You've got your plan. You've got goals, objectives, activities. Um, timelines, measurements, and you have staff accountable. So let me just pause for reaction, questions, comments. Yes? They should be involved in developing your strategic I think that's a great question. I'll give my answer, but I want to open it up to the, the room as well. Um, generally, board, board for sure, and if you have a large board, it may not be the entire board, um, it might be subcommittees of the board or a special ad hoc committee of the board. It really just kind of depends. Um, and definitely leadership of staff. Um, again, how I've seen it done is the board really with le staff leadership take, you know, take the responsibility of the SWOT analysis and really digging into things, ultimately then bringing in more staff to determine once goals, objectives are set, by the board. So the overarching goals and objectives, then the staff generally comes in and um, identifies what are the activities. What, did it, what is it specifically that we're going to do to reach those objectives and goals, and then who's going to do it. Staff usually fills in the blank on that. Could you expand on what SWOT analysis is? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So SWOT analysis, um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment, too. We have some flyers out that, um, in, in the front here on the table. Um, Bob Reynolds from Brady Ware, who we um, heard from this morning, he is going to be doing a strategic planning uh, workshop in February. Really interesting twist that he's putting on that. He does an environment, what he calls an environmental review. And during that environmental review in the session, participants will actually talk about in the legal world right now, in the financial world, in the political world, like what is going on in the environment around us, um, and then how does that translate into our strategic plan? Obviously, it's going to go into your SWOT analysis. So if we're talking about diminishing government funds, okay, that's something going on in the political slash financial world. How does that factor into our SWOT analysis and make sure that we're addressing that in our plan? In terms of um, leading the organization through this process, is that best done by bringing an outside facilitator, or is that an expectation of your board president? That is a great question. I have not seen a board president um, take on that facilitation role. I don't know if anyone else has. 
Um, I've seen it done a lot of different ways, and again, I'm going to report or uh, relate back to the why experience because we I was involved in this for ten different years. We had a different facilitator every year, so we brought somebody in just because they have a different perspective, a different twist. One consultant I remember came in uh, who was big on the the BHAG. Thing, the big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> so that was all the joke, you know, for a few years. Oh, what's our BHAG? But really, it was like taking us to, let's really, like Bob said, you know, blow up the box and think way outside of what we've ever been able to do. And what could those big, big dreams be? Like, he took us way out. We hadn't done that before. Um, other times we had a, uh, we had a wonderful facilitator from Wright State. Uh, you know, one time who um, teaches um, strategic planning. I'll think of his name in a moment. Um, I'm trying to remember who else we have, but again, we took a little different approach with a different facilitator. I think sometimes if you have a board chair, certainly if it's your, your executive director, I feel like that sometimes may discourage some candid, like really um, honest kinds of questions and that sort of thing for fear that we're going to step on the toes, you know, of our leadership. So I would caution from that perspective. But and, any other comments or <coughs> input on that? Yes. I teach the strategic planning session for SCORE in Dayton. And exactly, we, we really don't encourage you to have someone from the in-house because you have a certain perspective. But when you're bringing someone in, and the person that you spoke about was even more than a facilitator. So a facilitator just helps you move through the process. But the one that came up with the uh, big, hairy, audacious um, goal, audacious <laughs> goal they, they actually lend something to the process. And they're, they're more of a strategist than just a facilitator. And it helps you think in, a, in, in different routes and different ways um, about the strategic plan. And, what we were talking about putting it on the shelf, I always use an acronym of SPOTS, and that strategic plan on top shelf. And that's where most strategic plans end up unless you use them in your daily um, practice and as part of the board agenda, um, to do your board's agenda from your strategic plan. That has been approved. Thank you for saying that. And I'm sorry, tell us your name again. I'm Jalen Rowe. Jalen, Jalen. Um, so, number one, if you haven't attended SCORE's workshops, number one, they're free. So they're funded by the Dayton Foundation and some other foundations and partners. They are excellent. Um, so I'd highly recommend that if you haven't. We start our next it. session in the spring. Our last one, uh, uh, the fall session, is this Thursday, and it's on board development. One of the things I saw the Y do one year, and this was driven by the board chair at that time, so we had the, let me go back, we get it, we can see all this. We had the plan, right? And it was lengthier than this. Obviously there were, there were four goals, but there were more objectives under each goal, you know, lots of activities. So there was a fair amount to do. Um, and it was all spelled out as staff and team, you know, accountable who was gonna be doing those. <coughs> One of the board chairs asked for every single board meeting, could there be a piece of paper, it turned out to be this legal size, really tiny print, that basically all listed out, and then over here was where are we precisely this quarter in stakeholder meetings, for example, and every other thing. So we could see, oh, no progress, no progress, you know, so and so's doing this. Oh, yes, we did have a couple stakeholder meetings, but no, we haven't identified the staff member who's going to do that. Um, it was real, I loved it. And for whatever reason, I don't remember why, um, we didn't do it after that first year. I know the one board chair was really interested on staying focused, so we didn't get to November, December. Oh my gosh, we never did those stakeholder meetings. Now we got to scramble and try to get them in if we're going to reach our goal by the end of the year. And boy, look look now, it's the holidays. Nobody's available. You know, we can't get everybody's anybody's attention. So that really just kept the board on track, and the board had no question exactly where we are on our progress for the, the strategic plan. Bob. Jenny, can you say something about identifying an organization stakeholders? Oh, yeah, well, I think that can be different for any organization. Yeah. Depends on, obviously, who you are, what you do, who you serve. But I think there can probably be some general guidelines in an organization to look at, you know, mm -hmm. identifying, you know, 
you know, it may be specific business community, it may be the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, it may be broader than that. Churches, uh, to me, not other nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I'm all about collaboration. Who else is in the neighborhood? Who else cares about what we care about? Is there some way that we can collaborate and do this together? Um, you know, parents, families, if it's pets, you know, what are some other people and other groups that really care about what we, what we care about? Yeah, uh, the city, government, I mean, there's, you, you, you really got to sit down and define who is it. Well, you know, you, if you set your shop up, in our neighborhood, and you're just because that's where vacant space was. Okay. Becoming part of the neighborhood, <coughs> or finding the community in to understand what the mission is. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. um, again, who's around? Who, who, who? Because your word is going to get spread, right? As as you're meeting with people. So entering a neighborhood and then not talking to anybody in the neighborhood. Nobody knows who we are. What this new building is. You know, you get a lot of, um, gosh, you know, free press, right, when you're talking to your neighbors and, and explaining who you are, what you do, who you're serving, lots of other discussions. It just seems like any time I talk to someone and tell them what I'm doing, I almost always have, oh, I need to talk to this person, what about this, you know, here's a question, what's the status of that? So, yeah, again, unique to every, every organization and, you know, what you do. But it's important, clearly. Yes? Do you have advice on how to get this to be your daily activity? Because I can see where if I've got four goals that have each have two or three objectives with three or four activities, mm -hmm. I can see where my staff is going to be like, how am I ever going to get my job done? Mm -hmm. Even though this is your job, mm -hmm. but you know, I do you have advice on how to get the buy-in? Prioritize, prioritize. You know, again, our plans have to be realistic. So truly to run the day-to-day -day and focus on other things, new things like stakeholder meetings, for example, may not be realistic. So we may need to go back and say, okay, what can we do? What can someone possibly do in a year's time? So make sure, obviously, anytime you have performance <coughs> goals, they have to be um, achievable, right, realistic. Um, and then, you know, again, always looking at that volunteer. We talked about volunteers. Are there things that your staff are doing that potentially a volunteer could do to free up the staff member from doing the tasks, right, the daily things, and get them more focused on the strategic? Yes, I, I want to comment on that. We just yes. have a strategic plan, and if you go to your other slide where it says team and staff accountable, mm -hmm. I had one of our board members, I'm not the staff member that he is, that is his direct liaison, but he counts on me to get his voice heard. We put it out and the staff member's name was listed, but his name was listed as the committee leader. And he said, they didn't ask for my input. These aren't the activities. I would, I mean, uh, it sure. was a two and a half hour sit down conversation to kind of talk him off the ledge of it wasn't <laughs> his responsibility, it was staff responsibility. So I think being yeah. really transparent in that, Mm -hmm. When you have a committee overseeing it, when that board member sees their name on there, it, it was a big deal. But exactly. it took several days to get him. No, really, sincerely, let's sit down with the staff member. You'll be okay. That is a great point, Amber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really, we're not trying to get you to do all these things. You know, staff should be doing. Again, t team and staff accountable. That may not be in your actual plan. That's kind of a little staff. You know, version of the strategic plan. Yeah, so you've got name, you know, you've got names and that kind of thing attached. But to that point, it goes back to okay, what are the what are our board committees then responsible for? Maybe the board committee, there is a board committee, maybe it's an ad hoc committee that's responsible for helping with their stakeholder meetings. Staff wasn't expected, you know, to do the whole thing. So that needs to be translated into what are the committees doing this upcoming year? What is the board, you know, doing? What are your key volunteers? How are they contributing? Yes. And to the question of um, how to make sure that your staff buy in. For each of our staff meetings, I have uh, a list of things that relate specifically to the strategic plan and um, how we are tracking and doing that. I think it helps to keep the priorities in front of everyone if when you're meeting your regular staff meetings that you are looking at the, the various aspects of the plan as well. Mm -hmm. And then also in our committee meetings with our board members, there are always staff members who are liaisons with that committee and so we, we go back to the strategic plan and um, we sort of connect the dots there as well. That's great. I, to me the plan is the stick 
the stick as to why we're doing, the sticking of what we are doing, what are our daily tasks and responsibilities to what matters. I think we're all called into nonprofit because we want to do something that matters, right? So our activities, our work activities, our performance goals, they are stuck to the overarching you know, strategic plan and the mission and the vision of that plan. Right, so it matters. You know what I'm doing on a daily basis. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe the stakeholder meeting is not something I feel like I'm equipped to do, or I don't want to do. Um, but I know I got to get out there in the community. I've never done this before. You know, maybe it's something like that. But yeah, it matters. So now I feel more motivated that yes, what I'm going to do. I'm putting myself out there. I'm getting out of my comfort zone, but I'm doing it for a purpose. Um, you know, for the for the organization. One of the things that I say. Um, to look at the strategic plan not as something additional to your plate, but look at it as your plate, and then everything, and then everything yeah. comes up from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. We need to attend your workshop <laughs> next spring. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you express things. Okay, so performance goal. All right, so we got performance goal, um, and, and 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 I'm switching up up to say this is a stakeholder meeting just to follow from that example. Okay. So pulling in my HR background, I'm very passionate about this, a strength-based staff structure and development, ongoing development. If we're all about um, empowering people, empowering human beings, or even if it's pets or whatever environment, whatever we're working with, how do we expect to do that if we're not investing in our own staff and developing um, ourselves? So this comes from Marcus Buckingham. I know if you know Marcus Buckingham, he's all about the strengths uh, movement. He's an author, motivator, speak, motivational speaker. Just heard him uh, through the uh, Global Leadership Summit a couple of months ago. He says two things that ensure employee success satisfaction. Do employees regularly have the opportunity to use their strengths? I would um, also <coughs> extend that to volunteers. So do volunteers have the opportunity to use their strengths? I would bet Amber that that um, you know, uh, board member probably was like, I don't even want to do this, I don't do this, I don't like to do this, you know, it sounded like you were like, this is not my gifting. Um, so if, do, do staff and volunteers regularly have the opportunity to use their strengths, and do they know what is expected of them? Two key components to employee satisfaction and, and success. So if we're doing this whole strategic planning thing right, and it translates into goals, objectives, activities, performance goals and expectations, Clearly, staff ought to know what's expected of them. No question, you've got it. That one's already covered. But do they have the opportunity to use their strengths? That's another question. Um, I am all about, and <coughs> oh, you've seen me do this before, I'm all about blowing up the job description. And I'm an HR, I'm an HR person, and I used to drive people crazy because we had all these established job descriptions. Jenny, why are you going off the job descriptions? Like, forget the job description. Blow it, you know, totally up. If we have an employee who um, has a passion, has an interest, has a gift, and they need to be somewhere else, then put them somewhere else that aligns with your strategic plan and the objectives and the activities that need to take place, you know, next year. Um, I like this little, you know, kind of a, a model here. Agency needs, clearly that's your goals and objectives, that's your strategic plan, staff strengths and staff passion. The sweet spot, you know, there is right in the middle, clearly. Did it just get warm in here? It was really cold now. It just, okay, just hit me. <laughs> um, here's another way of looking at it. This comes from the Gallup, you know, group. Uh, again, the strength. Uh, base group, you establish expectations, that's clearly written in your uh, strategic plan goals and objectives, create the accountability, the accountability is you translated that into employee goals, performance goals, right, for the year, and you coach. So getting back to the blowing up the job descriptions, I want to give you an example of that. I recently was assisting an organization that, um, and I'm sure you can all relate to this, the organization really needed a um, program director, okay? So an overall program director for, for the organization. They also needed a development director, okay? Um, did not have funding in their budget for both. So the question is, which comes first? Is it pro it's like the chicken or the egg? Is it a program director? We need to evolve our programs and make sure we are 
re, you know, getting really good outcomes and in order to attract funding and donors, right, and serve our missions. But we also need a development director to support that, to find the funding, right, to run the program. I mean, it was like, we, the board went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Finally, it was the executive director who said, okay, hang on a minute. We've got an employee over here, by the whiteboard I charted out. We have an employee who's already on our payroll who is already performing program management, okay, kind of function. She is interested in learning financial development and has some great writing skills. So there could be some grant writing, you know, that's a natural place, you know, for her to start. Um, we have um, budget to hire just one person. So the, the consideration before was we're going to cut her hours because we need, to we need to make some room in the budget to hire what, whether it's a program director or a, or a development director. Wait a minute, we've already got somebody on staff who is running program effectively, has capacity and interest in doing some financial development. We only need to hire one person, not, not two. We don't need to cut her hours. We've got another candidate over here who had a little bit of both. So we ended up basically with two people that half of their, um, if you look at them as halves, like part of their strength is in program management, the other part is in financial development. Just hiring one person and marry them to the other person, we've got both covered. We've got a program director, but between two people, and we've got a financial development director. Does that make sense? And we just hire one person without cutting somebody else's hours. And again, the traditional sense is the job description is either program director or financial you know, director. So use what you have, leverage what you have. I'm all about talent audits. They might, will you humor me and say talent audit? Just repeat talent audit, talent audit, like who do you have, who do you already have? It is too hard to hire new people, right? And it takes so long to get people ramped up. I mean, I'm, I've been a new, sorry, I've been a new, closer, across the line. Um, I, I've been in a new position, you know, not that long ago. It takes at least a year to truly get ramped up to a new organization, doesn't it? To really learn the culture and the teams and the cycles and how everything works. That's a long time. Use who you have, figure out who you have um, and, and what they're able to do. Um, I've seen so many times when, again, we hire into that, the job opening is this, so just go hire or plug somebody into that, where somebody over here might have had a piece of that who's dying to perform, you know, a piece of that job over here. You see them just lose a little piece of their soul when that opportunity, you know, goes away and gets, you know, granted to somebody else. Um, okay, when you stop learning, you stop leading. I just came across that quote the other day. I don't even remember where it, where it came from. Um, and then Bob Reynolds, when I was sharing this with him, he um, completed the quote. He said he'd also heard then, when you stop leading, you stop living. So when we start stop learning as leaders, whether we're professional, whether we're in leadership position with our nonprofits, we're going to stop. If we're stopping, if we don't, if we don't continue to learn, we're not going to, you know, continue to lead. And if we're not leading, obviously we're not going to continue to serve our, our missions. Um, so I, I can't say enough about that. We need to model that um, we are learning kind of environment. I also heard a motivational speaker say recently, listen to the outsiders, listen to the outsiders, listen to the outsiders, listen to the outsiders. I mean, he kept repeating that. We were talking about recruiting new board members. So board members who really care about our causes, they may not have any experience being on a board. But that's probably good that they don't have experience, you know, serving on the board. They can be trained if they care about our cause. You know, clearly they're going to have a totally different perspective. And you won't have the unanimous vote, you know, thing that, uh, that Bob was, you know, talking about. There's going to be some very healthy discussion and new ideas being presented. So along with performance goals. So remember I showed you an example of a performance goal. When I write performance goals for individuals, um, I also include a training and development goal. I include that as a performance goal. So in addition to, I'm going to have stakeholder meetings, I'm going to lead that charge for next year and a bunch of other things, I also have a, um, 
uh, professional development goal of my own. Jenny is going to pursue training and development, professional development in XYZ, whatever it is that she needs. Maybe she is uncomfortable with, you know, getting out in the community, doing public speaking, meeting one-on-one, -on -one, never talked to, you know, community partners before. Well, then what's the training and development around that? How is it we're going to equip her, okay, next year to be able to be more effective at that? So, actual performance goal upon which I'll be evaluated at the end of the year. Did I d in indeed, you know, pursue that uh, development? Uh, did I read the book? Did I do a shadowing kind of experience with someone else who is more adept and, and comfortable with uh, stakeholder meetings? Um, whatever it is, work with a mentor, attend a training class, okay, on the job experience, etc. So that's what drives it home. If you are setting up an expectation that an employee is going to engage in their own development, I mean, that's when it happens. You know, clearly we provide that support. Yes, Steve. Sorry to take you back. That's all right. A little bit ago, something said talent audit. Yes. But I, I just wanted to get a bonus point for saying that. Talent <laughs> audit. <laughs> is that is that an interactive process between the employee and leadership? Is it only a leadership assessment for others that are there? Is it a combination? What 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 do you we have a couple of words you can throw out there that might provide some guidance on Sure. That. Again, Jenny's take. So I love to use different assessments. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Just I love this print finder, that's a Marcus fucking hand me a thing. Um, there's lots of other assessments just to really get but to use towards a talent audit. Um, also engaging others who know those individuals. So other management, you know, other peers. What do you see Jenny doing really well? Whether she's doing it right now or not, maybe that's, you know, not part of her actual job description, you know, get input from other people. Because, you know, for example, an um, organization leader may not see every individual all the time to see, you know, how, what, what some of their competencies are outside of their, you know, job description and their results. Um, I just happen to be really good at remembering what people tell me. So don't ever tell me anything you don't need to remember because I will remember that 10 years from now that somebody said that, you know, I'm really interested in, you know, going out in the stakeholder meeting. I've never met with the chamber. I will, I will remember that. Um, if you're not good at remembering that, then recruit somebody who is, you know, good at that. Ask people, though, what is it that you are interested in doing? I always do that. Here's what your goals and objectives are for next year. Here's what we need, you know, to have you accomplish. But by the way, what are you interested in? Uh, this is your job for the next year, at least, you know, in the foreseeable future here. What else do you want to do? What else are you good at? What do you want to learn? What are you, what are you interested in crafting? Make them a part of their development plan as well. So I would do a well-rounded picture. Okay. So the last thing, operational excellence. Excellent. So this is the fourth uh, key component. Again, the strategic plan, goals and objectives, that's what we do, who we're serving. Um, the um, performance goals for employees and volunteers, that's with whom we do that. Operational excellence to me is how we do that. Um, the Better Business Bureau has a wonderful program for this. Has anyone in this room applied for the um, Better Business Bureau accreditation, the standards of, okay, the charitable standards for excellence? Okay, then we have several. Um, I, on behalf of the Life Enrichment Center, where I serve as a board member, I volunteered to take that organization through that uh, process and learned a ton about uh, the, these four areas in the process and was able to actually devise and design some things with the Better Business Bureau's help that the agency didn't already have. So, Christy, do you want to talk a moment about the standards and what that is? Stand up, stand up. So I'll try to be loud. Um, so the, the session is on professional management. And we study those things because if we do what we say we're going to do, those strategic plan, big picture goals, then that leads to trust in your donors and your clients and your volunteers. So the Better Business Bureau does have kind of guidelines, standards for excellence in board governance, measuring effectiveness, what are what are your goals and are you checking on them? Uh, finances, what are you doing to review those finances, make sure that they make sense and that your money is doing what you said you it was gonna do. 
And also fundraising and informational materials. It ha I've seen things, that's really the next slide, um, making sure <coughs> that things are transparent, updated, accurate, um, and helpful and informational. So what happens when those things are not there? And I'm going to ask you, <coughs> what happens when your board is not engaged? Kind of translate to what we just heard. What happens? If you don't have meetings and they don't do anything. <laughs> Which, anybody had that experience? I have. <laughs> First of all, it's not any fun. And second of all, um, you're not going to accomplish your missions, your goals, your strategic plans. And um, another big thing that happens is, guess what, if you're doing any kind of fundraising or asking for money or you're out in the community at all, at some point you're going to have a donor ask you <coughs> questions. They're going to ask about their money. And if you don't have these things in place, you won't be able to answer that. And that is scary. Um, it could fold. Some of the challenges that I've come across is you'll have a, a small nonprofit organization. And just uh, last year, near and dear to my heart is animal welfare, <laughs> my side job. Um, and small animal welfare organization came to us and really struggled with, um, you know, they they might because it's volunteer run. Uh, they might meet a couple times a year. They meet over the phone. They're very connected and, and chatty. But they're struggling to get a donor base. They're struggling to get their finances in order. Um, so having operational structure helps you achieve your goals. And we can help do that. Now, we have materials online that can, uh, with samples that can help you with that. And um, it's just a good idea to kind of have a checklist of things that you could work toward. Right, awesome. So Christy's around all, all day, I think, so if you yes. have questions, okay, about that. Again, I can tell you that there were some things uh, when I was applying up on behalf of the Life Enrichment Center, also the Widow's Home of Dayton, so I've, applied, I've been through the application uh, process twice. Um, there were some things that we were doing in practice that just weren't documented. So the better business going through that process really helped us get them into policies and procedures that were documented in the event we were asked. And they came in handy later, you know, when we were asked. So uh, that was extremely helpful. So for some other things that were kind of confusing to us, okay, we weren't doing these things in practice, um, and needed some guidance so that our business bureau was able to help us with that too. I noticed this morning um, in one of the handouts, if you've got any handouts from the front table, um, Brady Ware also has a take five kind of a process as well that an they can help the organization go through. So um, we'll learn a little bit more. Is this great? You found that out? Okay. Oh, I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I must have my glasses on when I was trying to do this. So uh, anyway, so this is another free resource from one of our partners. So again, we can learn a lot about operational excellence and, and put some things into practice uh, where we need to. So that is how we do, right, what we do. So where is some additional support? So plug for some upcoming programs that we have. Um, as I mentioned before, Bob Reynolds, um, who is you know, our, our kind of moderator here today, he's doing this half-day workshop on strategic planning coming up in February. He's going to do that through the Nonprofit Collaborative, which is wonderful. Um, so Brady Ware is sponsoring and uh, facilitating this program. I'm really fascinated with this whole environmental review thing that he's going to be talking about. I've never seen that take place before. So the group of participants are going to talk about legal and financial and political and you know all the different um, factors happening in the environment and then take it you're going to have some documentation when you leave that session how do we take this back to our agencies and incorporate this into our um, SWOT analysis strengths weaknesses opportunities threats um, into our plan so excited for that um, so on December 1st, I thought this would be good timing I, because of my HR background, I actually facilitate this in the event organizations are doing performance reviews, right, and setting goals at the end of the year for the next year if you're on a calendar kind of a year. Um, this is coming up December 1st. And really the approach I take is not just the evaluation um, itself, but is setting goals, setting performance goals, training and equipping um, employees to reach those goals, 
and then obviously the you know the business results. So it's the whole life cycle of performance management. Again, this can be translated to uh, volunteers as well and board members. Out of this, um, you get a lot of the tools and the you know I just showed you slides, kind of snippets of goals, objectives, activities, accountability timelines, measurements. You'll get actual templates that you can take back to your organization um, and plug those in. Um, this is a twenty-five dollar, it's not an expensive um, venture half day, you know, kind of session on that. Um, we do through the nonprofit collaborative and our Shelly. On that half day, are you doing it? Yes, yep, now get the life nourishment center. Um, through the nonprofit collaborative and our partner, the Life Nourishment Center um, Leadership Development Institute, we do do these um, leadership development programs. We have several people in the room who have participated and or who are participating to really help leaders learn how to leverage strengths, how to assess strengths, how to leverage them, how to build teams based on strengths, even how to hire. All right, if you don't have the strength internally, how are you intentionally hiring, not just the job description, but, but actually for, for strengths and, and passion. So we run those programs as well. As Christy mentioned, she's got um, at the Better Business Bureau the um, standards of accreditation um, as well. So all of these partners come together to form the nonprofit collaborative. I didn't really go into that earlier this morning. Um, we all do what we do. Because what I've just told you this morning, the four key components, is so important. That's why we're running the kinds of programs that we're running. I'm not telling you all this just because this is what we do. We do what we do because we think it's just that important. So there are so many resources through these organizations that are affordable and accessible. If not, I mean, obviously, some of these things are even free, so that's pretty affordable, and they're right here in the, in the area. So please let us know if there's anything that we can help you with. Do we have maybe a minute? We are at 11.30 on the dot. I think that team's still going, so let's go, and we'll keep going. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes, Linda. This is probably going to sound like a weird question, but it concerns me. When is small too small an organization to try and do these things? Particularly if you have a relatively small board who's looking for direction all the time. But they're not self-initiated. Well, did everybody hear the question? Well, when, it, when is small too small to really do these things? And when, when you ask that, Linda, do you mean strategic plan? Like starting with a plan? Yeah, but, uh, accountability? You have a plan. But to try and collectively involve the, the board with that plan and go through all of this mm -hmm. uh, when there's like little or no understanding of what this means and, and why it's important and all that. If, I'm just wondering if there's ever a point where um, the leader of the organization just needs to go away and make that happen, do it, <laughs> and then bring it back and present it, I guess, to the board and say, okay, now let's discuss. You've got something to talk to and from, mm -hmm. um, and then pick through it that way. I mean, I don't know. It, it can be very hard um, when you're really, really small mm -hmm. uh, to, to get the ball rolling. In, in terms of strategic planning, again, we were talking about f facilitators and kind of shaking up facilitators for it. I've seen it done, like I said, different ways. Um, <laughs> and why one year we would have the staff, the leadership staff, really do the SWOT analysis, come back with the goals and objectives, and then have the board a thorough board review, not just a rubber stamp. Yeah, this looks good. Um, we we do breakout sessions and same things with the board. The staff was driving it to get started. Maybe that's a good way to get started. You really go through this as staff, <laughs> then take it to the board. So you're training the board. This is the process. Next year, we want you to take the lead on visioning. Who are we? What do we do? Who are we serving? And then develop those goals around it. I did give you a big, the example I gave you was a big strategic plan, but again, four goals could be a lots of you know objectives and activities. If you're a really small organization, you may be looking at just a couple goals in a given year because you don't have the capacity 
right, to do it all. So you really have to prioritize and, and, and narrow it down so you can be successful. Anybody else have comments about that question? Yes. Well, one of the things that we do when I was on a very small board for a very um, up and starting uh, nonprofit, we, we went as a team to different trainings like this. And when we came away, we all had a common language to speak around. Um, because we were so small, it was just a few of us, but we were there as that team. And when we came back, we were able to move forward. That's a great idea. Yeah, I love that. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk strength finder. You know, again, in terms of talent audit, we have done that before as teams too. I encourage take your team to that sort of thing, so everyone is kind of talking that. You know, that strengths language. So great idea. Take your teams of individuals to different sessions and things, so you've got that common language and right understands. <coughs> okay, what the what the foundation is. We'll take one more. Shelly. We went online and did it in the partnership with Hope. And when she saw her results, it's kind of interesting. And I've done it with her too, take more and more music and music classes. But, you know, seeing where we're compatible, you know, where we work together. So I think that's why we went online and it was like $10. So, you know, go online, take an assessment. And then compare your top five strengths, <coughs> you know, your other team members, mm -hmm. and see where everybody kind of fits in. So we just did that actually yesterday. And, and your sisters, right? Right. Okay, so was that telling? Like, oh, okay, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> accurate. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, everyone. If you have any questions, comments, feel free. I'm going to be around all day. Um, we hope to see you in future um, gatherings, and whether it's the nonprofit collaborative score, the library, better business score. Again, we're all out here to support you. So, and thank you again to Brady Ware.